5. Design for difficult climates. Climate, even more than landscape and soil needs specific design. For all practical purposes, man lives and gardens in only three broad climatic regions, zero the temperate and subtropical areas of winter rain and hot summers, the area most considered in this book, the tropical humid areas of summer rain, zero and the arid lands, where rain is irregular but may come as flash floods or sudden downpours. Cold deserts, arctic and mountain climates, and equatorial jungles are little occupied by man, and thus play little part in the world economy, although all have useful plants. Coastlines are not climates as such, but have many common aspects, and share with deserts the problems of wind and salt, so that coasts in general deserve specific treatment. In the following section I will deal briefly with the tropical and coastal lands, and more extensively with arid areas, as these are of greater extent in Australia and the Third World. 5.1 Arid Lands Perhaps the most pressing problem of the Third World, and of much of the Western World, is the rehabilitation of arid lands. Once the trees have been totally removed, the goat and camel flocks have killed all regrowth and the soil blown away or salted, reforestation is a problem. So is gardening. And yet, like all problems, we can find solutions. Some of these lie in studying the techniques of oasis dwellers like the Papago Indians of Tucson, described by Anderson, Pound those clever agriculturalists grow ancient crops, specialized kinds of corn, beans, and squashes which will produce a usable harvest on fewer inches of rainfall than are used anywhere else in the world. Few nations are showing the positive approach of the Chinese, who use straw mats to subdue sand dunes, and plant millions of trees in their baskets through this table cover, having now abandoned the folly of trying to grow grain on these areas. There are two approaches to the arid lands, neither as yet tried on a very extensive scale. L using species and techniques of known effect, as for the Tucson Indians, devising new techniques in the modern idiom, as for the bitumen mulch used in Morocco. Both need to be used in any integrated approach to desert rehabilitation. Although we have impoverished the flora and fauna of many deserts, we can recombine the remnant species of all deserts to make a rich agriculture. My own limited experience with Aboriginal Australians trying to farm in very arid conditions prompts the strategies given here. The text which follows is derived from a report to the Agricultural Advisors of the Australian Inland, completed by the writer earlier this year. Interest in the strategies noted has been high, and the original report is therefore collapsed into this book for more general use. Some plant species have been added to the original and the whole may make a small contribution to third world desert reclamation. Emphasis is on Australian species and problems, and particular 13 the octi issue of Aboriginal Nutrition A.N.D. Survival. The strategies outlined derive from visits to the Ernabella and Papunya settlements or Central Australia, and other journeys to Western Victoria, West Australia and Arid NSW. Problems of the desert and semi-desert are sometimes shared with humid areas, winter frosts from April to September, compacted soils, fragile sandy areas, and are otherwise peculiar to tropics, termite attack on living trees, or to deserts themselves, heavy populations of feral donkeys, horses and cattle. At Hernabella, the annual rainfall varies between, at worst, 50 mm and, at best, 640 mm. An average of 250 mm therefore means little and is locally irrelevant if the runoff from rock domes and the reserves of water in river beds, at bores, and in dunes or dry river sands is taken into account. Where we have hills, there is a well marked frost line at about 9 to 15 m elevation on slopes, so that tropical and temperate crops are both possible on the same slope. The broad strategies of desert reforestation are now well tested. Hostile drying winds, rivers, and local oases are the focal points for expanding the vegetation, if we start from upstream, securing the headwaters and catchments, from upwind, and from oases, 
then plants generate moisture downstream, downwind, and locally. In many areas, runoff from bare or rocky areas increases effective precipitation, so that small areas of a few acres to 50 acres or so may be selected where good underground or runoff water is available for gardens. Rock holes, some small dams, rock seepage, underground water in soaks or sandy river beds, bores, wells, windmills and dank water from roof catchment all assist gardens, and runoff properly directed would make gardening possible in many places. The aim is to use many more deep-rooted and climatically adjusted perennial plants for food and structural materials, in order that desert outstations may become more self-sufficient, and to devise low-maintenance systems of domestic agriculture. The less these methods rely on sophisticated machinery, transport, and fossil fuels, the better it will be for future survival, so that more natural methods take preference in view of the state of the petrol economy. The native vegetation of all deserts still presents a great resource, although fire-slash-grazing interaction and the presence of very large numbers of feral livestock and, in some places, rabbits, makes for great difficulty in establishing new plantings unless these are well fenced and protected. Treeless areas are evolving due to overgrazing after fire. Many small native animals are scarce or locally extinct due to foxes, dingoes, feral cats, wild dogs, and the large feral species of herbivores. Camp dogs in and near settlements keep feral grazing species at bay, and after recent rains around Ernabella there followed a dense regrowth of salt bush, acacia, and river red gum. But these same dogs also present problems with new plantings and with poultry, although older people cling to them for night warmth in camp conditions. First, one must state that in my opinion, based on real examples cited, that the dead center is a myth. Not only will many important vegetables and tree crops grow in deserts, but the native vegetation, where not overbent or overgrazed, is, in itself, a great resource. Water lies close underground in many places. Mulch material, as plants or leaves, is abundant. Growth in desert soil is phenomenal if water is available. Modern drip irrigation plus mulch will grow any domestic crop. While lawns, as such, are rather wasteful disasters, the potential is for a revolutionary forestry, and thus increased rainfall, and a reduction of dust and disease. China is planting 7,600 kilometers of her desert fringe, Australia could do the same, but hasn't as yet started on the first 7 kilometers, preferring to have an unemployment problem, dust, salted soils, and large profits for a few graziers. There has been little or no attempt to develop large desert water storages, or to encourage scour hole lagoons, and no extensive use of key line or Niger runoff techniques although road graders are now available for such work. The potential is great, but funding and government support are not very evident to this year. The outstanding movement of the Aboriginal people has enormous possibilities for pioneering arid land agriculture, and should be funded and supplied with the necessary species and materials, as a valuable contribution to our fundamental knowledge of the great areas of arid lands here and overseas and for the evaluation of techniques for use on a wider scale. The sad present condition is that most food, not of good quality due to transportation difficulties, is imported to settlements, and as petrol becomes scarcer and more expensive greater hardships will result for all sectors of the population. Therefore there cannot be too much emphasis on trials of new species on a broader scale and an emphasis on home gardens rather than commercial plantings is needed at this stage. These latter may come later as a result of the smaller trials in gardens and after the basic survival of residents is assured. For Aboriginal lands attention to cultural differences is important, if not critical, to the acceptance of new techniques. We can make too much of this. However, as people such as Horace Winiter at Ernabella, Johnny Cantawara at Warren Creek, and many others not Mount Placenta and are in fact producing good gardens of annuals, and the demand for trees from the nursery at Ernabella exceeds supply. 
two factors need to be accounted for. One is the rightful authority of guardians to protect any sacred sites, or direct the sort of gardens that are, or be tried nearby. The other is the sorry camp which means that all people move from a pla coloni where someone has died. The former does not exclude very much land fr, om tree crop considerations, and the latter may be accounted for by the establishment of a separate sorry camp nearby gardens. The sacredness of certain trees like the native fig, I slash I, in some areas must also be respected although this does not preclude usage as a vine trellis while elsewhere it may be used in more profane ways for hybridization or rootstock. Children need the same familiarity with cultivated species as they have with wild plants, and this will come in time as trees become more common, the habit in wild gathering may be to break off a branch and pick fruit from that. Certain vegetables are unfamiliar, and need to be learned before they are food, or are picked at the right stage. There are, nevertheless, many favorite foods and cultivated fruits and nuts, and experience will give skills in using these. White ants, termites, are a problem peculiar to tropical Australia, ordinary ants, in great quantity, another, eelworm, nematodes, is a pest in market gardens at Alice Springs, and cabbage moth is generally distributed. Hawk moth larvae attack vines, as ever and dogs make it difficult to keep small livestock. Fruit fly is a problem in some areas, but is local in distribution. Absent are possum, blackbird, starling, sparrow and other such nuisances of the temperate grower. Fencing, mulch, tree polyculture practices, and the use of forage poultry under tree or vine species would greatly reduce all pests. Many hardy tree species seem, in any case, little affected. Local best controllers such as Moloch Horridus, the anteating Mingari or Mountain Devil may be of help, as would Guinea Fowl. Marigold, Tag and Des, control 90% of eel worms, and these together with Pyrethrum daisies may help with termites. There are many termite resistant trees in the area. Wallflower extract helps with cabbage moth control, blended and sprayed and other natural controls could be dried. My club NSW, reports that they are attracted to, and lay eggs on, the Dachera lily, Bnergmansa, but the larvae do not then pupate. Wood ash and sour milk are also recommended by Neil Douglas, and the harmless Deris dust is a complete control. Fruit fly is not a problem in the presence of ground scavengers such as poultry, which also help with termites. 1. Local Strategies These fall under the following categories, home gardens for local survival, selected design in settlement, broad-scale planting for climate modification runoff for local selected site planting. Home Gardens Here the aim is to make gardening an integral part of desert living. Around the house, wolfer, in the best protected, fenced and guarded areas, where feral herbivores have least effect. Rabbits are kept at bay by dogs, and most organic wastes accumulate. Water must be present for settlement to persist, and thus the waste water from showers, toilets, and roof areas is available. There is a combined aim in gardening, first, to use such resources productively, and second, to alter the house or will to climb it while so doing. As in temperate areas, sheet mulch is an answer. Useful species for mulch provision, and as street and garden shade trees are mulga, acacia and eura, tamarisk, any of the desert oaks or casuarinas, and tall cultivated bamboo, grain or sugar cane wastes, paulonia, acacia albida, and luca enna. Trickle irrigation plus mulch is the key to water conservation, the reduction of salt and carbonate accumulation, and the buffering of pH values as humic acids tend to offset the effect of highly alkaline soil. Plowing only increases alkalinity to intolerable levels. Around Wilches the area is swept free of burrs, and bones and ashes can be added to the mulch, as can the droppings of cattle, dogs, and other feral species. The result will be less rubbish for flies, thus less eye problems, less old clothes to carry scabies and attract pests. 
Heat plus water causes rapid breakdown of all materials mentioned. Topping up with leaves is the main maintenance activity. Few, if any, special tools are needed, and digging is superfluous. House planning. The following suggestions are made with a view to modifying the climate in and around the traditional house or wilter. In so doing I am not implying that wiltjes are necessarily the most desirable of dwellings. The people themselves must be given the opportunity to decide the types of structures they would prefer, and the funding to build them. Thus it is not suggested that well-designed houses are not needed at outstations, but that, at present, the existing structures could be more productively designed. By erecting deciduous vine trellis, grape, or trees, acacia albida, to the north, evergreen vine trellis as an arbor to the south, Tacoma vine does well here, the climate of the house is correctly modified. Vine trellis over wilter roof, and ivy or trellis on house walls has a similar effect, figure 5.1. Daltamarisk, white cedar and giant bamboo could be used to screen cold say winds and provide mulch, and light foliage to Paulonia or A. Albida to the north providing shade for both house and crops also helps. In the cool arbors, strawberries, mint, black currant, gooseberry and soft herbs will grow, again in deep mulch for water retention. The ou or windbreak near the wilter can be provided by smaller bamboo, or as screens to prevent cold air flow along house walls in winter. Trellis and deciduous species provide shade to the north. If decorla or ivy grows over the roof, so much the better. A small or strongly constructed roof can be soil covered, mulched, and planted to ice plants, cacti, succulents, and hardy desert species. Watered, these roofs sealed cool air in summer, and act as external insulation for winter cold. Vines on walls, or on trellis set out from walls, have a similar effect on heat loss and gain. Then gumper. Shade house, O, uh, windbreak, and wilder, house, are fairly sophisticated designs for comfort. It may be advantageous to make these permanent grown shelters, as per figure 5.1. For hunters or for overnight camps, especially if soil covered and mulched, A uh, can be easily grown. These tactics save cutting mulga at camps. All these strategies provide climatic amelioration and save fuel. A schematic wilter, figure 5.1, could be tried out as an outdoor living environment. All suggested adaptations can be made to existing structures, or designed into new houses. At present, hot water from solar collectors is proving to be very satisfactory, and light for wiltjes from solar panels plus battery is certainly possible, as are solar electric fences for wild cattle and camels. Dry toilet systems could be installed at outstations, or areas reserved for burial of feces in tree crop sites. Then gumper is used by Kim Ji to eat to shade his ducks. Traditionally these are thatched and sheltered with pole, spinifex piled on top. The same spinifex should go to mulch after use, and provides good insulation for roofing, figure 5.1. Ginger Wickeliiri is trying grapevine or trellis to evolve a shade puree, and there is little doubt that combinations of bamboo, trellis, spinifex and vine would make for very comfortable living outdoors, or as attached arbors on houses in hot weather. Andrew Pryor is to try the modified mortlock or tree-like trellis devised by Brian Gooms at Wait Hort. College, Adelaide. In permanent houses shower water can be led to slotted pipe drains under the shade house or garden. At Wiltjes, pebble mounds with showers overhead would provide water treatment and garden moisture for citrus crop or vines. Many showers, so placed, make garden watering an automatic process, and washing up, shower, bath or washing water containing soap, lead and mulch, is a benefit, not a nuisance. It is a matter of integrating the garden with the waste water from washing processes. Sewage and silage. The safest disposal of sewage is in pipes or trenches below plants. The lagoon or pond for soiled water at Ernabella is not yet planted, but is the ideal site for dates, plums, and peaches, both on the banks and around the pond, 
where the water seeps to the creek underground. Even the most paranoid of health inspectors would approve this safe conversion of waste water to vitamins. Sludge from septic tanks can be let go into pre-dug planting holes, filled over, and dates, mulberry, or fig planted. Grapes bear fruit, from cuttings, in 18 months in this climate. Similarly, raked or mown plant material can be pit mulched and covered near planting holes. Raking under bamboo or tamarisk serves two purposes, to provide seed-free mulch, and to protect the mother plant from fire. Termite-proofing timbers, early trials of cold soak, butt soak, treatment for fence and trellis would save much timber in future. Bamboo, mulga and eucalypt should be butt soaked in tain alith before use. Present vine trellises of radiata pine so treated, and should last indefinitely. Tainalith copper chrome arsenic salts, is available from agricultural suppliers, and comes with an instruction booklet which should be requested. Treated timber is safe for children to handle, but should never be burned as both fumes and residues are quite toxic. This is an essential technique, as termites seat, in a few years, valuable posts which take forever to grow. Trellis and bin sticks also could be treated to advantage. Tain alith is also a handy paint for exposed planks. In hot weather, a three-day soak suffices. Poles should be trimmed and cut to length before treatment so that treated waste is minimized. Bark may be mulched on gardens, as are, chopped, foliage and twigs, in orchard apostrophe. Many termite-resistant species exist or can be grown. Ideal relationships, water, etc. Figure 5 point to the ideal relationship of water, wilter and garden is fairly clear. Any advantage of slope is ideal, so that settlements like Willys at Alamparu is a model. Here a rocky cleft was dammed by hand, concrete and stone, to retain a clean clear water pond. Overflow goes to a larger swimming pool edged with sweet rush. From the top pond a pipe leads water over 1,200 m or so to the Ertju area, at head. Showers can later be sited in the garden, and moved as trees establish around them. Windmills, petrol-free, are very effective in raising water to height. My class and Andrew Pryor plan a 7.5 m model. This allows growing above the frost line, on hill slopes, of more tropical crop, further protected by a Albida, Paulonia etc. for frost protection. Guava, pawpaw and mango may then be grown on foothill slopes. Neither high rock dams nor windmills need a great deal of attention, the gears of the mills lubricate quite well with castor oil, or jojoba oil, which also grows well in arid areas, and needs only a crude press to process. Tanks on hills and ridges, if not covered produce abundant green algae and mosquitoes. Goldfish, Chinese carp, and grass carp eat both these nuisances, and provide occasional meals. Earth floors in tanks or dams also support freshwater mussels, themselves excellent water filters and food, and shell grit for poultry. Native snails provide grit for ducks, who appreciate these pests. Mosquito control can be provided for by using small fish in standing water. Broad scale planting. Bulk seed of, for example, date palm, jujube, cork oak, pistachio, plum, white cedar, tamarisk, sweet chestnut, honey locust, garab, mesquite, paulonia, and bulk cuttings of grape, fig, tamarisk, mulberry, and coprosma could be set out over trial areas. Selecting niches for special plantings. Stone and desert pines would be a probable success on ridges, as would desert oaks. Asparagus may take well in river sands, where some wild plants were observed, and like hardy species also. If limited trials succeeded, these or similar resources could be spread on a broad scale. Burrs, for rabbits, cacti, and wormwood, not eaten by cattle could help protect seedlings, success may depend on the reduction of feral browsers, or on the protection of trees by natural thorn and rock crevice situations. Plates or divisions of cacti would almost certainly succeed. The system is worth diversified broad-scale trials. 
erosion control on dry slopes, the net and band planting pattern of figs. 5.3 and 5.4 is an effective control in overgrazed, eroded, mined or bulldozed sites. If tires are available, the pans can be made from these, filled with mulch, and the diversion drains led in above the tread level. Some fortunate people have access to logs, which can be staked across a slope, on a slight downhill grade so that water is made to zigzag across the erosion face, and hence absorb into the ground. Even small logs and branches, bed across erosion channels build up a layer cake of silt and leaves, beside which willow, tie tree, acacia, or any other fibrous rooted and hardy species can be planted, which then act as a permanent silt trap. Mulch behind logs and barriers quick of stabilizes the seed bed for planting. Fallen leaves and scattered dung also accumulate in these mini deltas to provide plant nutrients. On very steep slopes there is often no recourse other than to plant pampas, bamboo, and rootmat pioneers, and to make up slope plantings of chestnut, acacia, garab, olive or other large species which will cascade seed down slope over time. Where implements such as chisel plows can be used, the same pattern of net and pan is effective and erosion control. What we tend to see however, are fairly massive contour trenches allowing little soil absorption of water, creating dry strips on slopes, and exposing a great deal of subsoil, such heavy-handed approaches need massive machinery, and achieve little in the way of water control and soil improvement, compared with plan chiseling and planting, which makes a permanent and stable change on hillsides. Selected Site Enclosures These apply to areas of high natural runoff, such as the base of domed rock, Piedmont at valley mouths, rock seepage areas, and old sheep pens where large quantities of dunga make underground water sponges. Andrew Pryor and Kim Jitaya are testing out several such sites with olives, pistachio, grape, mulberry, fig, and apricot, as well as adapting small rock domes by the use of concrete gutters, hand molded, figs. 5.5 to 5.1 I. Such sites repay fencing to discourage large feral species. Solar electric fences would help, and outside barriers of cactus, jujube, wormwood and bamboo could be developed into barrier hedges. Ivanari and Yemens recommend that any area of runoff be in the ratio of 16 or 20, 1, or that a dome of at hectares be led to a garden of 4,000 m1 acre, or so. Runoff for local selected site planting clay pans, plier, domes, bare rocky ground and Piedmont slopes can be graded to lead all runoff water to small, chisel plow odd areas where permanent crop or gardens can be established. Already, existing roads provide one such resource. Alan Jenkins, of Papunya, suggests that the numerous graded road drains be led to walled and chiseled enclosures, or directly planted to trees and new drains graded as these establish. At present, the drains themselves show an improved growth of trees. Road graders are available, if infrequently, to try out such techniques, and the plantings at Ternabella using Ivnari's idea grow eucalypt and tamarisk at present. Automatic siphoning could be a feature of such impoundments, as rain is unpredictable. Again, small trials would suffice to test these methods, see figs. 5.12 and 5.13. Clay pan, plier or dome led to small covered underground ramp tanks greatly assist the survival of useful quail, pigeon and poultry in arid lands, and fish can be used to keep them clear, see figure 5.14. The use of plastic sheet over holes, or mounds in salted water, see mags 71, p. 120 are techniques which may serve small gardens or individual trees. Some very stony country, as at Alamparu, present opportunities for rock mulched garden on a larger scale, using 60 to 90 centimeters lines of gathered stone to mulch between plant rows, figure 5.17. Philip Gall, in conversation, says that Aborigines of West Australia use a modification of this technique to trap night moisture for drinking. See figure 5.19. All of this needs time, 
machinery in establishment, and hard work, but the end result is a low-maintenance system, repairable by hand labor only. 2. Livestock. Feral herbivores. At Ernabella, cattle and rat ts, and at Papania brumbies and camels, fewer rabbits, make garden establishment difficult, while eating out traditional aboriginal wild food plants, 60% are judged extinct, the rest greatly decreased. Damage to young trees and broken branches on old trees are obvious. Numbers of herbivores are very large an estimated 6,000 cattle and 20 to 30,000 brumbies, wild horses, on aboriginal outstation land, which supports only 1,700 or so humans. The animals, at present a disaster in that environment, could represent a potential cash resource if their utilization was properly funded, and planned by a group of people allotted to this problem alone. Culling by cattle stations, who muster stock from aboriginal lands, has left a lot of older bulls and cows. Many of these are of use only as sausage meat or pet food. After December, or in dry periods, the feral species are easily trapped on waterholes, using existing techniques of trap yards and swing gates, figs. 5.22 and 5.23. Other pot semi colonel. Eal products are dried meats, hides, leather, horn, blood and bone and selected export gamels for Saudi Arabia, or selected horses for southern markets. Approved trailer-mounted processing units may be one answer, and market research is needed. I may mention, as an aside, that Kew Gardens bacteria a horse each year at the base of an old grapevine, and harvests some seven tons of grapes. But to poison or destroy all these animals is a waste of a potential cash resource and gainful employment. Bulls and bull camels are a danger to people on foot, especially at night. Their fouling and breaking down of riverbed and waterhole are obvious, and they prevent tree regrowth over immense areas of land. On dune country animal tracks cause bare sand to blow in wind. There is no doubt that smaller softer species such as poultry, wallaby, emu, and euro or kangaroo are to be preferred. Such small meats need no freezing as they can be eaten at one sitting, and cause little damage to the environment. The potential for utilization of feral species is obvious, but, again, needs personnel and funding to succeed. The whole question of feral species needs a separate team to resolve it. Automatic trapping at tanks and water holes has been perfected. The problems are transport or processing. Alternatives, distasteful, are mass burials in areas to be planted. Foxes and feral cats are special problems. The rabbit, outside fences, is seen as an important food resource for nomadic peoples, and largely replaces small marsupial meats for families on outstations. Judicious regional poisoning in the early establishment phase of desert forests seems to be the answer for the rabbit. Ultimately, as suggested by Frisch 27b total destruction of feral species should be the aim. Their presence means a severe reduction in native species, animal and plant, elder reliance on domestic meats until the rangelands recover for emu, kangaroo, euro, wallaby, and regrowth of the native plants that were once the support of the nomadic tribes. Exotic domestic species ducks and hens, their eggs and surplus breeders, would seem to be the main potentiae source of domestic protein. In tree crop areas, they also present opportunities for pest control, of ants, termites, snails, and are useful, as rakes, in fire control. Housed in insulated, spinifex, shelters on the south side of glass houses, figure 8.3, they prevent night frosts in winter, by emission of body heat. Guinea fowl and pigeons should be considered as prime candidates for camp food resources the latter in traditional dovecotes, and the former as herded flocks, both supply eggs, and meat. In mug areas, a great deal of natural seed falls, and guinea fowl also utilize many insect foods and pests. On range, poultry may need elevated roosts and nest boxes, on pipes, to escape foxes and goners. 
pigeons in dovecotes are immune to fox predation, figure 5.24. Fish have many uses, even, as mentioned previously, in the reduction of algae and mosquito larvae in tanks. Together with yabbies and mussels in dams, they also have some protein potential. Native fish species may be recommended by the Narandera, NSW, hatchery, but in any case there is no risk of fish escapes via the desert and salt pans that buffer these areas from permanent streams. For this reason alone, deserts are an important trial site for water poiculture species. Bees present an opportunity not only for honey but for pollen. Pollen traps, ref. 28, are available now, and would supply high-protein flower additives for outstations. Native animal species, the review by Frit 27B is rather gloomy, and there is an obvious dearth of native Australian species at outstations. Some small reptiles, Moloch horridus, geckos, may be of use in ant control and pest control in glass houses, as would frogs pools provided. Shooting, particularly at night, kills many kangaroo rejected for food because of no fat or yellow fat. Baited compounds or traps at water holes make far more sense, as fat-free, female, and old male animals can be released to breed again, and only the immature and well-conditioned animals taken for food. I believe that active planting of emu berry, honey locust, Tree lucerne and like forage may increase native animal numbers, but only if very selective trapping, not indiscriminate broad-scale shooting, is envisaged. The real solution lies with the extermination of the feral ruminants, and with them, many of the flies that carry disease. Meanwhile, domestic exotics are needed at the outstations. There are many areas, known to the Aborigines, where wallaby and rat kangaroo survive. These could be nuclei for spreading harmless native species into the homelands if feral herbivores were controlled nearby. 3. Aboriginal Skills In gathering seeds and small fruits, the Aborigine rakes clean the leaves from under-selected trees, spreads skins or makes a funnel in sand, then beats the trees to bring down fruit or seed. By so doing, he has incidentally protected the tree from fire provided a drip line mulch, and thus altered the chance of survival of high-yielding trees. This is just another example of how, in his long history in Australia, the Aborigine has acted as a de facto agriculturalist. Gollan Joe records how they also stored seed in clay-lined pits, baskets, wood or stone hollows and transported seed over great distances, trying out such plants as native tobacco, mink culpa at selected sites. Meats were dried, mussels stored in damp sand, and clay domes were made. Mulching is no new thing either. Water holes were thatched over to prevent evaporation, and it took only one demonstration with old blankets, cardboard, clothes and mulga or tamarisk hate to persuade aboriginal gardeners that mulch was a good thing for water conservation. By mulching, the ashes, bones, and litter around camps are converted into rich garden soil, aided by water from showers, washing and kitchen preparation. The action of soil fungi, termite and bacteria in the heat of central Australia, quickly reduces bota ashley noxious wastes to soil, hence to a food resource. It has been traditional for the aboriginal children, and adults, to break off mulga twigs and branches to gather mistletoe berries, scale insect sugars and edible galls. Some effort must be made to show correct methods of harvesting introduced fruits such as grapes, oranges, and small fruit to people unused to picking the fruit, rather than the tree. Sophisticated tracking skills are evident, as is skill in food preparation. A very large, and large white and recorded vocabulary exists, detailing food paints, fire effects and control, the links between species, and general ecological patterning. Combined efforts by linguists, botanists, astronomers, ecologists, and generalists are needed to recover the detailed information of the older people of the deserts, and to record the uses of plants for food and medicines. This is very worthwhile on medical grounds alone.
but more so for the potential value of native plant species in arid lands generally, or for their use in areas where tribal knowledge has been lost. 4. Permanent grain plots. Aside from garden and orchard, the rehabilitation of natural foods, and enclosures, there are other techniques applicable to arid lands. Perpetual grain plots, unplowed, can yield about 11,750 kg of grain per hectare, 10,500 pounds slash acre, plus legume seed. Such a system would be ideally sited under vine crop or paulonia, small trials of about 400 meters squared, L slash 10 acre, are needed. Using the Kazairo ripple flow process, all grains, sunflower and legumes can be hulled and ground to flour in one machine. This machine needs a 16 HP tractor, motor, and hulls or grinds 4-5 tons of grain per hour, so is suited to central processing in small settlements and communities. Purchase price at $4,500 means many people must use one machine, although a similar but smaller model may be developed in the future. Trials on native seeds such as mulga would be useful. Poultry forage systems. It is very probable, with the many useful acacia species present in arid areas, that a successful forage system could be quickly evolved. Some poultry forage species are suggested below. Sunflower does well everywhere. Heads can be cut off and fed entire to poultry. Resists fire. A trellis for lab lab and pole bin crop. A good short-term windbreak, provides some mulch. Almost wild at Alice Springs, Papunya, Amabella. Husked, it provides good oil and food for humans. Deserves broad-scale trials as a grain crop. Unopened heads can be eaten as a vegetable. Millets, sorghum, sweet corn, sudax. As above. Sudax as a mulch-slash-border species, sorghum for sugar, seed. All can be used as human food or forage. Native seeds and berries. Panicum decompositum, native millet or culta culta. Eragrostis eriopida, wangana. Portulica oleracea, wakati. Themida ostrafia, kangaroo grass. Onia reticulata, emu berry, malu, nalupuj chinopodium radinus de chimpas pallidum jubiflorum acacia and eura. Mulga, Wata or Karaku. A. Campina, also for Wichiti grubs. A. Blosericae. Caulini. Victoriae. Bina ovati. Longifolias. Pusae. Oswaldia and all of the above have been used as food plants for man with the exception of emu berry, Onia. Eaten by emu and crested pigeon. Acacia sp. Mungona and many species of large seeded edible berries, including those of the mulga mistletoe, and ganja, and a blackberry evergreen, a wiru poultry would also utilize the nut grass, yalga add to these, the exotics, tree lucerne, gymocytus proliferus, black locust, robinia pseudocacia, honey locust, cledicea friaganthos, also for pole timbers, banana passion fruit, Passiflora mollissima, stands frost. Mesquites, Precipus spp. Comfrey olive, also for oil. Lespedes a lucerne, also for sprouts, green forage. Mulberry a first class poultry fodder, esp. White mulberry chinkway pin oak, quus mullen gi, sweet acorn. Helm oak, q. Ilex, evergreen. Cork oak, q. Suba also for cork. Chestnut oak, Q. Prinus. Plus any of the desert oaks obtainable. All acorns are good fodder for storage. Some are sweet to eat. Acacia albida, C. ref. 17. Could also be of use. The Kaziro, Division of Plant Industry, can but a have seed of a perennial rye and millet, well worth forages trials. If an area of mulga were fenced and selected breeds of poultry tried out, with guinea fowl and pigeon, the foregoing species would provide the bulk, if not all, of the fodder. Most species could be introduced with mulga as the cover crop, 
and other less useful species gradually eliminated. Close observation would give a lot more data on a free-range poultry system for arid areas. Surprisingly, ducks do well at Ernobella, but need special protection from dogs, foxes, etc. Grain could be fed in early stages, and lab lab bins tried for greens and ground cover, in alternating bins. Poultry on range in mixed orchards greatly reduce the larvae of insect pests, especially fruit fly and termites. Aquatic species as dams, tanks and lagoons are developed, more attention should be given to aquatics. Golantuji mentions a native wild rice, and the multiple uses of the water lily nymphia gigantas talks. Tubers, seeds. Nadu, a fern, is also an aquatic, as is native arrow root. Tripper or cherries, water chestnuts, do well in this climate in SW. Asia, as does lotus. Sweet rush present, I think, at Ernabella, provides shoots and bulbs. Tripper should reduce some evaporation from open tanks or dams. Notes on Aboriginal Nutrition Dr. Rachi Kalakarinas of the Aboriginal Medical Centre in Sydney agrees that improving nutrit, iron and hygiene at camps and in outstations would be better than all the medical services for health, in conversation. High vitamin C content in fruit, especially for women before and during pregnancy, is a prime aim. This is a good reason for involving women directly in the gardens. Plants he recommends, which are possible to grow above frost level on slopes, are pawpaw, mango, tomato, peppers. In addition, asrolu, barbados cherry, parsley, and any green leaf crop are also of value. Field testing of it. C. Content of fruit juices is cheap and easy using the C sticks developed by the Ames Company. This is a simple dip indicator used to measure vitamin C content in mother's milk, urine, and plant juices. Both milk and urine should show high levels of excretion. Fresh fruit needing minimal care, no artificial fertilizers, sprays, or forcing, is best for vitamin C content. Advisors and camp gardeners could test the success of their crops and check on the urine of mothers and children, or teach them how to do this for themselves. The same tests should be applied to native species, store foods and fruit juices supplied or bought on outstations. Some investigation could be made, if it is not already, on the effects of clothing on vit. Desynthesis, hence rickets in children. The publication Modern Urine Chemistry Ames and Company 1976, is available from the Miles Laboratories, 13, Spring Street Chatswood, NSW 2067, and may be helpful in outstation health analyzes. Acknowledgements and apologia It is very pleasant to sit here, in cool and green Tasmania, nursing my tropical ulcers, and make bright suggestions. My admiration for the men like Mike Last and Ken Hansen, who spend years at their work in pretty awful conditions is unbounded. As often as not, dedicated people are as much impeded by whites who are exploitive, or by paperwork, as by the task ahead. Young people who go to the center see how necessary it is to stick to the job for years before results appear. My admiration for the intelligence and endurance of the Aboriginal people is also great. They know many things we need to know, about meaning in life, and about their country's ecology. They will be successful again, despite the messes we have made for them. I am very grateful to Charlie McMahon, and Mike Last for organizing the trip, to Charlie, Andrew Pryor, Mike, Alan Jenkins, Gim Tchitaya, Ginger Wikulai Willie and John Kant to war for data on plants, techniques, native species and for transport and assistance, and to Rosemary, Wendy, Jane and Jill for hospitality and cups of tea. It seems clear to me, even today, that the eventual inheritors of the arid regions will be, almost solely, Aborigines, tha, we have a long-term outlook to take and that Aboriginal people will slowly become masters of their own lands in this area of Australia. We can impede or assist this process, but not halt it. As a people, they are, when fit and well, active, intelligent, 
marvelously adapted company their environment, quick to learn, and capable of every sort of craft and technical task. We block them by demanding literacy in our terms, by denying their culture, and by continued racism. Sadly, there is too much evidence of ill health in adults and children, and to little A and iron. We persist in erecting institutions to deal with what is basically a domestic situation. We lack barefoot doctors and barefoot gardeners, especially the latter, who strike at causes rather than effects. Millions are wasted on sophisticated buildings which don't work and give nothing to thoughtful design. White employees, chosen by the government, are at times outright racists, in it for the money. A cynic would say that we intend to perpetuate the misery of the people, in order to sustain the aboriginal industry. Like Dr. Dugid, I feel very angry and betrayed by MV own race, in their lack of action, goodwill, and involvement, and by the attitudes of some public servants. The world will judge white Australia in the light of results, not intentions. Good intentions are not enough. We must listen to the Aborigine, and by so doing will gain much ourselves, or take the path of the Rhodesians and South Africans. The contrast between the non-productive, Pine Gap military expenditure and the misery of people around it is glaring. It was the same in Iran, and THP turmoil there reflects the effects of senseless repression and TE maintenance of haves and have nots. 5.2 Tropics Paulson greatly reinforces the thesis of Pernagufcha 1, where we called attention to the nutrient pump role of trees. Both leaves and roots trap minerals from air and weathered stone, and the leaves recycle to topsoil. Precipice in area, he says, penetrate to 30 m, Acacia tortillis spreads a root net 40 to 50 m, so that planting relatively few of these efficient root nets ensures a large safety web under gardens. In drier regions, this same author recommends a albida, a unique species which is deciduous in the wet season and so does not shade crops when rain falls, but protects from clear sunny skies. He also has praise for zero tillage farming in tropics by way of branch mulch from precipice, acacia, and ailanthus ix are used as hedgerow, windbreak, and fodder crop for sheep. Farmers in Rajasthan, India, maintain as many as 40 precipices in a area per hectare, and the nutrients are detoured through livestock as an ideal way of using branch mulch. Paulson illustrates how cotton grows under she butter trees, while Van der Muellen recommend Lab Lab, delicious, bins under Bobasus palm. Frank Martin and Ruth Roberti of the Mayagas Institute of Tropical Agriculture, Puerto Rico, have printed yet another of their excellent guides to survival and subsistence in the tropics. They also develop a plan for an excellent little round garden of essential crops, paying great attention to nutrition. Their books are basic manuals of knowledge and skills, with reference to almost every aspect of tropical survival via plant and animals. Figured here is the excellent Samaka Guide Row Home Site Farming of the Philippines. It is also on the edge of the monsoon area where Fukuoka 3 has developed his remarkable no dig system of growing using only poultry as manurial sources, ducks are good pest controllers as vile as recyclers. So it is not for lack of strategies that we do not have a stable tropical system evolved, just that we need people to put the strategies together and practice them. As well as strategies, species and layouts, the essential design for wind, sun, and human comfort is also needed. In the humid tropics, the shade house of temperate zones may need dry mulch to dehumidify air as it is drawn into the house, and there may need to be defenses on both sides of the house, as the sun traverses from tropic to tropic. Compensations are the vast range of useful fruits and year-round production of crops. 1. Humid Tropics It is in this climate that I, like many Europeans, do not thrive and it is difficult to sort out the right of species and combinations. Here, almost all nutrients are mobile, and contained in the web of life. The soil is fragile, easily leached, often very deeply rotted, 
and converts quickly to laterite or erosion gullies if cleared. If ever tree crops had a place, this is it. Trees grow easily from seed and cuttings, divisions and roots. Some trees are necessary at all times, even over crop. Paulson asserts that more than 75% of the soluble plant nutrients that are present in a certain area are held within the biomass of the growing plant community. These nutrients, he says, are not absorbed into the soil, as in temperate climates, but are caught in the web of roots and fungal symbionts below the soil surface. Only transitory fertility is released by clear felling, then the leaching of nutrients, and sterility of soil results. Paulson's small pamphlet is a manual of condensed strategy for humid tropics. Converted into diagrams or schematic figures, his and Van der Muelen's lesson is clear. We must maintain high biomass by mixed perennial slash tree slash crop species in wet tropics. Even in this climate, the winds that blow outside the rainy or monsoon seasons are very arid and damaging, carrying the breath of the desert into gardens. Thus, the same windbreak and forage strategies that apply to temperate and arid lands still apply. Mulch is as much, or more important, and has more manurial value and animals of all sizes help keep the energy on the move and are useful as harvesters of scattered nutrients. 5.3 Sea Coasts The edge of the sea, wherever it is, has its peculiar difficulties. Across the great unmodifiable plain of water, winds arrive at gale force, carrying salt and abrasive sand grains. The similari I to both desert and altiplano or high plateau country are obvious. Birds, plants, and other species demonstrate that to us by their common occurrence in desert, coastal or montane regions. Waders, chores, currajongs, crows, starlings, certain berry plants and insects for which these birds act as couriers, also show the same distribution, and some frogs share coast and high plateau or coast and desert in common. The defenses of the permaculturist can therefore be gathered from all these environments, and the gaves, yuccas, palms and cacti will be as useful inland as on sea coasts, as will all tough, woolly, thick-leaved, waxy, shiny and needle-leaved trees. All serve the same function resistance to wind, drying out, and salt or sand. Gorky barks and fibrous tempt species also help to resist sand blast as does self-mulching such as is found in Timorisk and Casuarina. Fibrous palm and yuccas thames are notoriously tough. Plant water reservoirs like the bobab and bottle trees, the fleshy ice plants, memembrian thumb and salt bushes are helpful species, as are the New Zealand coprosmas and the hardy coastal pines, Rucaria, coliferous. Certain other species also show promise. The best guide is a visit to exposed gardens near the sea. Where sea coasts benefit most is in the low incidence of snow and frost, the generally more temperate climate, and a greater frequency of night dews and mists than the dry inland. The great problem is salt burn, when sea winds blow in dry periods, and deposit salt on leaves. As Lillian Callow points out in Trees for the Sea Coast, the Tree Society, 258 Mill Point Road South Perth, W.A. It is the salt death of eaves rather than wind pruning which accounts for the streamlined shape of trees near the sea. The really valuable front-line plants are those tall and graceful windbreaks that will stand against the first onslaught. Examples are, coconut palm, cotton palm, canary palm, date palm, Norfolk Island pine, macrocarpa pine, rottnest island pine, oyster bay pine. Behind these, Lower bushy species, some very hardy, suppress the ground wind and form thickets or hedges. Boobia and acacia, banksia, tamarisk, garab, cape thorn, crested wattle, coprosma, buddle ear, matricida rose. And within the garden, lower hedges of rosemary, wormwood, nemus, chilling barberry, pampas grass. In damp areas, hedgerows of coastal tea tree, melaleuca may be pruned or unpruned, and provide useful stakes and poles. Some of these species are, Melaleuca pibescens, M. 
hypericifolia, leptospermum levigatum, m. flave essence. As the first ranks decrease the wind, a complexity of more useful species follow, such as olive, carabin, kaffir plum, bamboo species quinces, and the usual mix of stone fruits and citrus. Nectarines, in particular, appreciate the mild winters. And, eventually, a complex of legumes and fruit species in sheltered nooks, only a few hundred yards from the coast. On hillsides and in less exposed areas, most needle-leaved pines, p. Pinea, p. Pineaster, p. Radiata, thrive and provide the acid mulch which offsets the alkalinity of desert and coastal gardens, or provides the mulch for blueberry crops. Both in deserts and on coasts it is advantageous to shelter early plantings with fences or trellis, and to use these as frames for low climbers, many of which are also creeping species useful for ground cover. Kennedia prostrata is recommended as a good leguminous mulch by Ruth Jennifer of Perth, while Mesembryanthemum, Delicious, Tacoma, and Tetragonia species, amongst others, prevent sand drift and keep soils from drying out. Many local fleshy or tough creepers can be found on coasts. Lupins too, both annual and perennial varieties, thrive as coastal scrubs, and add to soil fertility, binding loose sand as they do so. On rocky, exposed headlands, Quisilex, an evergreen oak, Casua inia and Calitris spp break the winds for later inland development. 5.4 The creation of small climates in homestead and self-sufficiency design, even redundant structures and earthworks can be designed to modify climatic extremes, to provide niches for important or preferred plants, and to reduce active energy needs. Thus, aspect of slopes is critical in deciding between drought-resistant and damp-tolerant species, every building has these aspects, and by trellis construction, their effects can be increased. In new gardens, the great lack is wind shelter. Species such as citrus, avocado, and macadamia struggle to survive. Thus, the fastest possible assistance in these cases is to build trellis at near right angles to E, W, and N walls. Such trellis has a multiple effect, it separates functional space into recreational, garden, or service area, prevents the flow of cold winds along walls and acts as a sun trap, and itself presents a basic structure for vine crop. A trellis built on earth banks, tire or stone walls, at rockery buses are even more effective as early protection. They may curve out from the house corners, or simply break up a facade on a school or large building, thus affording several places for benches, lawns and gardens. Frequently, in institutions, Large building surfaces converge to make wind tunnels. Trellis is often the only answer, and arrowed entries baffle the wind further. Similarly, roads of no real thoroughfare value are mostly designed as clear wind tunnels. Large boulders, plants, and trellis convert them to sheltered and sinuous access, and block dust, cold, and noise as a side effect. This is true of all driveways, service roads blind entries and minor trafficways. Horizontal trellis has several dollar uses, to shade windows from full summer sun, and to create overhead vine trellis to shelter tender crop in desert or extreme summer climates, and to increase the solar fadiation on crop. The refreshing coolness of a shade house in the hot Australian summer has to be experienced to be believed. Even tiny pools, a few ferns, and a spray or drip of water increases the effect, both physically, by evaporation, and psychologically. Air in such places has a different quality, an aliveness normally missing from the languid air of still areas. Trellis can always be backed up by permanent windbreak, and as this grows, trees can evolve with their shelter growing to protect them. Additive features are the reflection or radiation from walls and ponds, some of these are figured, but even so we rarely see a glass house constructed with a reflective pond to the end, or a solar pond as heater. By just rounding a corner, the climate alters from one suited to the soft herbs such as celery, parsley, chives, and strawberries, 
to a dry, hot site suited to the aromatic herbs, and producing many more oils. 6. Structures. Man lives in a built environment, in all climates. His shelters are at the core of the zonation system of permaculture, and whether he builds for himself or his livestock, it is essential that the new buildings are so constructed as to supply their own heat and at least some food. It is in buildings that most domestic energy is consumed, where we survive the extremes of heat and cold, and where we may supervise and plan the evolution of our life support systems. It is self-evident that a diverse garden becomes a source of a variety of foods that do not need to be cooked, so reducing the need for cooking fuels. The old emphasis on grains and pulses has created a demand for fuel that countries, like India, cannot afford. Nuts, fruits, greens, and many root crops need no cooking, and are of equal or superior food value. The homely strategies of cooking in one pot food that needs only reheating, and of cooking for a larger community are also important for fuel conservation. While the greatest waste of energy is in irresponsible industries like those which produce packaging, newspapers etc. and gas guzzling motor vehicles, the householder should aim to achieve the least energy use for his own sake, and at the same time attack the rationale of energy wasting at the industrial level. 6.1 The Reactive House One can do no better than to read, or reread, Kern for inspiration on passive climate control in housing. But, as he points out, locally developed systems are evolving that suit specific climates, and many architects are, or should be, aware of the cheapness and benefits of structural control of heat and cold, though, as yet, I see no evidence of this in Tasmania. People will spend enormous sums on house materials, land, and pea. Ants, often without consulting the cheap design books that would save them much greater sums in future maintenance and upkeep, and many houses are already built, or being built, without any thought of few euro oil shortages and present rising fuel costs. For this reason, I have included data on the late adaptations Thai can be made to established housing as still as some strategies for future buildings. The whole thrust of reactive house design is to reduce or eliminate the need for external energy input for climate control. Because the sun heat is regulated and stored in the heat masses of floors, walls and water tanks, and drafts are excluded, then the very slight heat yield from body warmth, cooking, and perhaps a small pot-bellied stove is all that is needed to keep the air space warm. What can be added to the architectural designs are biological aids, as turf roofs, wall and roof creepers for external insulation, glass houses and shade houses for food production and climate modification, and thus a better integration of the house and the external environment. But, to start with, all people building or buying houses need to know the basic principles of the reactive house, figure 6.1. An essential book for all Australians is that of Deborah White and the Melbourne team who worked on this and other energy problems, for other designs see Go Evolution Quarterly, SMA 78 and subsequent issues. The SNAIs of a reactive house are, it is sheltered from cold winds, hence needs designed windbreak planting, see figure 2.5, it is oriented on an east-west axis, facing the sun. Thus, an attached glass house is feasible, there are no windows, or very small fixed windows in the E and W walls. These walls are then available for external vine crop insulation, trellis, or shrubbery, there are few windows and doors in the S wall, and thus shade house attachment is facilitated see figs. 6.1 and 6.2 the whole house and every opening is very well sealed for drafts. Only essential vents, very small, in toilet and bathroom need to be open at all times, in areas with hot summers the N. Aspect is shaded by deciduous trees or vine crop. These are emitted in cooler areas, all walls and ceiling, and the perimeter, 1.5 m, under floor slabs are insulated. Seagrass is the safest insulation but insulation made from treated waste newspaper is also efficient, massive structures such as chimneys, 
floor slabs, brick walls, tank of water etc. are, where possible, inside the insulation barrier and therefore act as heat banks. The ideal house is reverse brick veneer, bricks are inside the house insulation. The eaves of the house, and the height or depth of windows are so adjusted that winter sun strikes the full width of the front floor slabs, and that the summer sun does not reach the walls. Fig.6.21 All windows to the north and south are fitted with heavy, floor-to-ceiling, well-fitted, pearl-matted, curtains or blinds. Such homes are not only cheaper to build and cheaper to maintain than houses which need oil heaters and fireplaces, but most importantly they enable people to survive in warmth and comfort without recourse to oil-based fuels. It is no longer necessary, nor perhaps even sensible, to build any other type of house than one which saves or generates energy. 2. House Modifications Changes to existing structures follow the same set of criteria. An attached glass house to the north and a shade house to the south, figure 6.2, plus sun trap planting, trellis and insulation go a long way to reforming an existing house. The main problem areas lie in the often perverse arrangement of rooms in older houses, many of which face the road rather than the sun, and in the mania for glass windows in all outside walls. At least the glass is available for more sensible use, or for double glazing smaller window areas, houses more energy, efficient, as below. The planting of sun trap trees, a tenement of trellis or shrubberies to the southeast and west attaching a glass house to the north side if possible. Attaching a shade house to the south side in hot summer climates, fig.6.1 and 6.4. Careful draft proofing and reduced ventilation, block all old ventilators, insulation of ceilings, vines or trellis along E and W walls, and adding heat mass as concrete slabs, tanks and brick or stonework within the glass house or insulated warm rooms. The basic references for attached glass house design are Fisher and Yander and McCullough. An attached glass house has the following essential features. It may be oriented to within 60 of due n. Towards open mid-sky rather than n. East and west's walls should be insulated, and of solid construction, base should be insulated, especially around foundations, wooden frames to be used to prevent heat escape, metal frames lose heat too quickly, single glass panels are the most durable and efficient glazing, if a pit is dug below grade as the base. Less heat is lost to the outside ground, a very well sealed top vent is essential, water in small containers is the best heat store, pools help, and these may be placed below banks. The glass to be at about 45 to the ground for greatest efficiency, and plain white paint to s. Walls reflects heat efficiently. If it is necessary to vent heat in winter, then more heat storage needs to be added to capture the excess heat so water-filled containers are perhaps the most simple way to do this. Figure 6.2 diagrams how the system works. In summer when the house is too hot, open V.L at the top of the glass house, air escapes, drawing in cool air from V.4, over the damp mulch and through the vine-covered and ferny shade house, where a fine spray or drip of water on the mulch keeps the air cool. In winter close V.4 and V.L, Open V.2 and V.3, so that by day warm air from the glass house circulates in the insulated rooms. Close at evening, trapping warm air. Both shade house, for small fruit and brassicas, and glass houses, for spices and tropicals, yield food for the family while cutting down on fuel costs. So, we eat more cheaply and better, and live more comfortably by installing these passive energy systems. Fisher and Yander 34 deal with at least part of this system the glass house, but all, those who have a shade house can testify to its beneficial efficacy in the Australian Sioux buildings, as in a school designed with Sweetnam and Godfrey, Vi. By T shade area allows cool air to be drawn into all courtyard buildings, and gives a refuge for teachers and children in extreme summer heat. Even the dripping of water helps as does the sight of ferns in a droughted landscape. Water tanks, 
often regarded as so outré and old-fashioned that a street in Perth, W.A., took up a petition to have the tank of a new, ex-farmer, resident removed as unsightly, can be vine covered in the shade house as a cool air slash water block. Tiny snooty residents didn't win the farmer still has his tank, and they have water restrictions and salted soil. In really cool climates, Ireland at right angles to the walls decreases cool wind and forms warm air pockets to the end. And by arranging hot water usage to the end side of the house, a double benefit is arrived at. One solar ponds can be filled either outside or inside the glass house for hot water provision, and two heated water from sinks, showers, and baths can be released into a cooling off tank inside the glass house. See figure 6.14. 6.3 The basic sun wind defenses or alliances. Structures breasting the wind should be like a vessel breasting the sea, either easy in entry like a sharp bowed boat, or permeable, like a raft, or both. Thus figs. 4.5 and 4.6 suggest HJ shaped sun trap, curved and permeable back to the cold winds, and facing N. The figure shows even wings on the U forms and a due N orientation. This may not be the best shape or orientation for every site, for instance, if a local site features salty and strong easterlies, such as Howl about my house and garden as I write, then the U should be higher and longer to the E than to the W. If mornings are sunny and clear, and evenings cloudy, or the sun sets early behind a western hill, the U should be swung towards the knee. To gain ost sun, on very hostile, dry, windy, shoreline, or cold sites, a whole series of interlinked sun traps may be the only sensible way to plant. Note that in wind protection nets see figure 4.6, the corner junctions, as on the left, give squarer fields than do center junctions, as on the right. Similarly, sunscreens may be curved and tapered to admit low and early light, based on the known path of the sun. 6.4 Some novel houses. Earth houses. While working in the icy and windswept plains of Highland Tasmania in TE 1960s I had the job of stripping trout eggs in midwinter snow, and of transferring fish to less densely stocked and therefore more productive waters. By chance, roadmenders raised an earth bank about 1.8 m high behind our frigid cabin and thereby made a dramatic change in climate. By insulating us from the winds to the S. And by trapping sun heat to the N. Our hut was made much more comfortable. Larger bushes eventually grew on the spoil heap than on the plain, and this led me to evolve the idea of an earth house for bleak, cold, windswept and hostile areas. The design for this follows, and in the opinion of Ken Yeomans and other expert earth workers, the house is both practical and cheap to make, even as a shelter for animals or a storage shed. The developed earth house has all the insulation factors of vegetation and earth, plus a moated water supply, indoor wells for waste disposal and water supply, frost clear roof as an indoor glass house, and d the whole structure would cost less than dollar l, o dot o to construct, plus floor slab and roof trusses, figs. 6.5 to 6.7. The Pioneer Osti Alien Dairy, figure 6.8, is, as everyone who has inherited one can attest, a very cool. Below ground storage and fire refuge. Desert dwellings need be of similar underground construction. Plant houses. There are varying degrees of integration of house and gdant from the totally grown house to vine covered or sod roofed conventional structures. The Sun Herald of June 18, 1978, reproduces a photograph CTF a biostructure designed in Stuttgart, Germany, by Rudolf de Ernach, which has a fairly conventional light steel and timber frame. This frame is grown over with evergreen, waxy leaved klim, jing plants, several species of ivy, geranium, and coastal climbers suit this description, and the arsalt is said to be warm cozy and weatherproof even in the cold European winter. The occupant are said to benefit from the generally healthier surroundings.
Only doors and windows need to be kept clear of vine, and if the structure is designed to take creepers, trimming is unnecessary. The building figured is a glue-like in form. The same article figures a building which is basically a coralline deposit, using an electrolyte such as the sea or fresh water to deposit chemicals in a free-form metal mesh of any shape the result is rather coralline cave in appearance. Ref, Professor Wolf Hilber, Ertz, Director, American Inst. For Exp. Architecture, Faculty of Arch. Texas Uni. USA. Here, plants are used as integral parts of the house structure. Figure 6.9 was designed for a field shelter for domestic animals. But would a exclamation tilde be a feasible tropical home? Only very light structural members are necessary. Figure 6. I2, A. T. C. Adornak, has the further refinement that a fully enclosed and vented compost box provides background heat. Materials dry stored in autumn, and charged at three week intervals in a box of this type would burn at about ISO, C until composted, rather like a slow fire. Again, placement in a glass house or animal shelter is of use. The loss of warmth and of cool air in buildings is most affected by the winds which pass along the walls. Still air or water is the best insulation, and in plants this is the air trapped in a tangle of stems and roots, or the shelter given by screens and shrubberies, see figure 6.15. Climbers, screens, dense shrubberies and windbreaks should all aim to reduce airflow around buildings, thus increasing the usefulness of insulation. Holger Wishart an S. W. I. T. In conversation. Notes that wind passing over and around solar heaters is the main cause of their inefficiency. For this reason they should be encased inside the roof of the building, lying on the roof insulation and protected by a glass skylight about 50 mm above them, rather than exposed to the winds. Stephen Lisiak, in conversation, May 78 measured the gain or loss of heat over bare and vine-covered brick walls in spring, to obtain data on the effects of vines on heat loss and gain. His findings are as yet to be published, but briefly, ivy on brick walls suppressed the entry of about 70% of summer heat excess, and prevented the escape of about 30% of heat from the house at night. Dozens of brick cavity buildings could benefit from this simple biological insulation. 6.5 Minor Designs and Techniques Sound Walls One of the annoying, and damaging, facts of roadside and industrial living is noise. While it takes a lot of forest to blanket out some noise, the insulation that we use for walls, and thermal efficiency, helps greatly with noise control, as do massive stone or earth brick walls. I became interested in the problem in relation to hospitals and old people's homes where rest is essential, and in one-story buildings landscape design can certainly help, especially if this factor is noted early in planning, and space is made available to insulate for sound. It takes 100 m of forest to cut out 6-7 decibels of sound. Sound comes in many wavelengths, and the lowest and highest sounds, long and plus sort wave. Need different approaches. Insulation, perforated surfaces, double glazing, draft proofing all the features that prevent cold from entering and la. Percent dilda to imped high frequency noise. Low frequency sound waves behave more like water or waves, three it can flow over barriers. Both can be reflected by dished or baffled systems, or absorbed in insulating material causing a very small heat increase. Earthworks, vegetation, or insulation all help, and the design of the highways, where earth's spoil is too often neatly leveled out, so permitting noise to flow uninterrupted. Well-placed embankments of earthed over tires plus good house insulation, as per section 6.1 is the answer to intolerable noise levels. The sod roof. Sod roofs may be newly constructed or rolled over strong existing structures, using a plastic film stapled below as a moisture barrier. Chimneys etc. are flashed as usual. 
The metal roll under carries water to the spout, while leaves drop off. The slotted angle or log, indispensable on steep roofs, holds the sod from slipping. Trials of smaller roofs on sheds and animal houses are probably the best way to get the technique and species, right, and as the weight of winter sod roof is great, loads must be carefully calculated. I can always bring a nervous ditter from an Australian audience by suggesting that they shift their lawn onto their roof. But I am being fairly serious, as sod roofs are great active insulators, and any strong, or strengthened, roof would take sod, either as ready rolled lawn in humid areas, succulents in dry areas, and with daisies, bulbs, herbs and furbelows to taste elsewhere. The sod root mass effectively insulates. The roof never needs painting, and can be repaired easily if damaged by adding a little soil and seed, if Norwegian models are anything to go by, it should last for 200 or more years, probably longer than the house itself, Weemsk. For weak existing roofs, especially those of zinc or aluminium cladding sheet, ivy over the roof serves as well, providing the guttering is adapted as shown, figure 6.16. Evapotranspiration, plus judicious watering keeps the summer heat out, and air and foliage, the winter cold at bay. Sod roofs act, in fact, like ivy on walls. Neither increase fire risk to the house. Fire mandalas figs. 6.17 to 6.19. Fire may be trying to get in, to a house or town, or out, from a public fireplace. The orientation doesn't much matter, what matters is that the structures and vegetation are integrated and designed to block fire. A fireproof array of plants is diagrammed below. All are sappy perennials that will not burn, unless permeated by grasses. All are green in midsummer. Sunflower are also included, an annual. Most annual gardens resist fire, as does damp mulch. If such systems are fenced, and poultry stocked after midsummer, their scratching and browsing greatly decrease the fire risk represented by grasses, or if the system is closely planted and attended to, the chance of fire damaging any plants or structures behind such a barrier are slight. Windows Colin James, in conversation, October 78, has pointed out to me that the best skylight is, in fact, a clear fiberglass pool or shallow aquarium as the water insulates, and gathers light from the horizon. Such pools may need to have 4% formal in added to keep them clear, or else they need to be cleaned regularly to remove fish feces and plant residue. No such nuisance deposits occur in wall aquariums, however, and these windows can be stocked with plants and fish, and shaded to prevent algal growth. The fiberglass tanks of the new alchemists would serve as windows in normal rooms, as well as preventing heat loss they produce food, recycle nutrients and are of great interest to the inhabitants. What better view than the inside of an aquarium? Kern illustrates how windows may be better used as vents and air scoops, and also notes that vents may be built without opening windows at all, so that long horizontal, roof, floor, and wall vents can be of solid construction and functional design while glass in windows remains fixed and therefore more easily draft-proofed. Back to the cave the steady state and cool conditions of caves, brick tanks, walls, fire refuges and root cellars offer great advantage in the storage, preservation and care of a great variety of goods. Elise Chalmers, W. T. 1978 uses caves to store spare tractor parts because of lack of dust and a dry atmosphere. Ghoul caves greatly prolong the life of citrus, root crop and leaf crop in store, and are cool air sources in summer. Old mines, wells, and constructed caves below floors have all of these uses. Also, a cave near the house has value as a family refuge in catastrophic wind, fire, war or heat wave. Such structures may be dug into banks, under floor cellars entered from floor traps or outside cellar doors, or above ground structures of ribbed steel or pipes earthed over for protection. Radiation from fire is prevented by T-shapes or a dog leg in the entry of shelters. 
caves underfloor are a part of climate control systems, maintaining a constant low temperature, as in Kerr P, or forming a reservoir to drain cold air off windows at night. Caves or earth shelters outside the house form the essential fire refuge for those who live in areas of high wildfire danger. Sewage and other filthy matters scruple not to enrich the dried up soil with dung, and scatter filthy ashes on fields that are exhausted. Virgil. It is in the production of dung and ashes that soil nutrients are lost, consequently they are sacred to agriculture in the philosophy of the Chinese. There is a sensible balance between so much nicety that nothing gets done, and common hygiene. Ironically, most health inspectors I know are awfully concerned with germs, but not at all with sprays and industrial residues. Such is life. There is no sane technological solution to sewage waste, it is the province of the biologist. Canberra is learning that lesson at great cost. In trying to sterilize sewage by using complex technology they end up with an expensive and dangerous product chemicalized water. Mary Bra, Vi. Has taken steps towards sanity in Sanita Dotchen, using water and soil to deal with the sewage outfall of some 8,000 people, flow about 1,300,000 ol slash da. Here, the writer cooperated with P. A. Yemens in designing wildlife and biologically oriented sewage lagoons, which feed hundreds of wild fowl, and then discharge to key land fields, deep chiseled as absorption filters, thus removing the taint of blackwater residues and excess nitrates from the runoff. All sensible town sewages treatment from flush toilets must follow the same path first to primary mechanical breakdown and the removal of solid wastes, second to methane third to a trickle filter, from the to lagoons and finally to soil absorption before being turned back to the stream.